Free run episode 6, the hero of the village. My dude's been doing some redecorating. He might have a really soft heart, he might actually really care about the villagers. But I mean, a lot of this is going to be about his, his own feelings of fraudulence. Yeah, yeah. He himself doesn't know how to answer that. He wants to believe he can. But the real thing is totally different. Part of it has to do with the fact that while we generally think of ourselves as being just one unit, the brain has channels and some are more conscious than others. And thinking about something, planning something, is a very conscious level of analysis. But the things that are truly terrifying are things that activate that, that deep subconscious level that you don't necessarily have full access to. So how do you train it unless you're actually in the situation? But in huge situations like this, you can't really train yourself in the situation because like, how do you train against the giant dragon? Sort of the question like, are you actually going to do it? The question is a really frustrating, I don't know, you know? You can make all sorts of resolutions in a certain state of mind when you're in a relative state of peace and safety and that all goes out the window <laughs> as soon as the, the conflict begins. It's like that Mike Tyson quote, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. I think there are a couple of work throughs though, small micro steps, exposure to smaller scale versions of the thing and scaling up as you get more competent and comfortable, practicing things in as close to the anticipated format as possible. It's that concept of if you have a big exam coming, you should take practice exams under conditions that replicate the conditions of the actual exam. Visualization, I think, can go a long way. Closing your eyes, putting yourself in the situation, allowing the fear to kind of wash over you, and then using your conscious mind through that. And then maybe most simply, but also probably the most difficult, just doing it. <laughs> like just doing the thing. There's something cool about having a timer, making a sort of vow to yourself that when confronted with a thing that scares you, to jump into it within like three seconds or something. Because if you don't do it in the first three seconds, your fear is going to catch hold of your mind and you're just going to go in a loop. It's kind of like getting into cold water. You know, you just jump in. Tying it all together is a general sense of faith in yourself, that you're capable of surprising yourself, that you definitely have the potential to do what you're most afraid of, and that the only real failure is totally giving up. The failure and resentment that comes from not acting or failing, I think can be really useful. As long as the takeaway isn't like, I'm not capable, I'm just done trying. If you like can successfully harness that energy and power and foster that sense of disappointment, to be used as energy so that you're looking forward to a chance to have that situation again so that you can counter that image of yourself or counter that failure, that can be a really powerful thing. Speaking of Zenitsu, to hear Stark talking, I hear a lot of negativity in what he's saying, but for me, actually, I feel like it's a positive thing. Like, this is him pushing himself. It means a lot to him, and he's, like, harnessing that towards a single point, which is the dragon. And I know all too well that even in moments where you're receiving accolades, even when people love you for who you are, if you are not matching the expectations you have of yourself, it doesn't really matter what other people think of you. Because you know, on a positive side, the same works in reverse. If you're doing everything you feel you should be doing, if you feel like you're living up to or exceeding your own expectations, nothing negative can get to you either. Because again, you know. <laughs> So far, Stark seems really cool as someone who's really, like, pinpointing his focus and energy into what he, he wants to be. Impressive that you're alive. I mean, <laughs> that's actually better. It's cooler. Oh, but, but he already said that Stark reminds him of himself. It's a lot of his own self-directed pain. That's where that came from, most likely. I don't think he will either. I think this is like a rare case of like ruminations being positive. Did we see this? I don't think we saw this. Oh, because we knew she would be able to handle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sink or swim. Everyone's waiting just in case. You got the capability to surprise yourself. You just do your best to prepare before the moment. Right. Right. That's that's what you can do. Did you have to phrase it that way? He's sitting here smashing a rock, for God's sakes, on his free time. I mean, that's coming from something. There's something in there. We don't know yet. I mean, like... But that's good. You don't know that you have it before you do it. You know, like I kind of reject this whole fake it till you make it thing. Believe in yourself and you will succeed. How are you supposed to believe in yourself if you haven't done anything worth believing in? Like you should doubt yourself to a certain extent. It's healthy. But the cool thing is you then can turn that around with action. You can actually build something more real through what you do in the future. Like do you want to trick yourself into 
thinking that you can do things or do you want to like know you can do things because you've done things? There's so much talk and energy dedicated into like the right mental framework. And I'm not going to completely discount that because, you know, you're going to be some combination of your thoughts, your thinking pattern, your schema for life and your actions. But the actions are a really cool way to just jumpstart that whole thing in a very real tangible way. And the thoughts will follow. On the mental side, I think you reject negative theories for which there's no evidence. For example, like I haven't done this yet. Okay, that's fine because you haven't. That's a fact. I can't do this. That's dubious because you don't know. You probably could if you wanted it better enough and if you took steps towards it. And even if you, you won't end up doing exactly the same thing that you're imagining you need to do, just starting down that path will lead you to a thing that is just as satisfying, maybe even better, fills the same kind of emotional needs despite being somewhat different or somewhat of a pivot. You just go out and do the thing to the best of your ability and you keep iterating until it's successful in a way that is meaningful to you. Then you don't need to waste any energy on the rumination about whether or not you can do it because you've done it. I think you know, and I think I know too. I think it will be fine. Which doesn't mean <laughs> shit isn't gonna go wrong. I don't know. If this man can cut a dragon like he cuts a rock, I have some faith. He'll show up. Oh, you showed up already. Kruin also, I think, gave him a very manageable task, which will get it into the task, might end up helping him slay the dragon, which is just keep it busy for a bit. It's not just the villagers. His whole, like, identity is wrapped up in this. People will say it's selfish. There's this idea that there's no actual altruism, like all altruism is, is self altruism or something. And I think that's true, but I also don't think it's bad at all. I think it's beautiful. Like if you genuinely want to help people from the depths of your soul, it's about you, right? But it's because you've developed yourself and access something greater than yourself that you feel connected to. And once you understand and see that, it's connected into your feedback loop of like reward. I mean, what else could it even be? And why would it not be a beautiful thing to like selfishly want to help others? Yes. Kind of feel bad for the dragon. <laughs> the dragon's just a, just a stepping stone for our development. Oh, it's beautiful. Looks like something from Demon Souls. Dark Souls. I wouldn't have expected this from Aizen. That's cool. Right. Oh, yeah. I was saying it might be a way for her to understand Himmel, but I mean, it's definitely Aizen in this episode. She gave him the 30-second limit. I feel like you're gonna end up killing it. Just being, just getting his foot in, just starting. That's half the battle. Start the timer. No one said it had fire. <laughs> Can we, like, get the character development we need without killing the dragon? <laughs> Look at Furin being so happy at his development. Damn, he's doing this without ODM gear? <laughs> Impressive. No cables for him, just jumping. Better than killing it would be like taming it, imagine that. Let's get like a dragon joining our party. We'd have to walk everywhere. No more wagons for us. Why does this remind me of Disgaea? Freeman is just like... No oh, shit, he killed it. <laughs> Freeman just become his master. Oh, oh well. But yay, character growth. Justice for the dragon. Yeah, had a feeling. Now there's a danger of him getting arrogant. <laughs> Well, I think he earned it. Like I was saying before, how do you know you're capable of something big and terrifying, especially something you've encountered and failed before? Again, the answer is you don't, but like you prepare for it anyway. And the preparation is really going to be the thing. Waiting and ruminating and being hopeful that you can do it in the next situation is a gamble and probably a way to ensure that you keep doing the same thing again and again with the same outcome. Don't we have like an unlimited inventory spell? She didn't go straight for the grimoire. Ridiculously fun. Yes. How many near death experiences did they have for Freeran to get her food spells? Aizen 
Aisen's a lot deeper than I initially perceived. Very tedious. He never really would have guessed about Eisner. His face is so obscured by hair. Well, you could just defeat another demon for the syrup spell. Don't do it. <laughs> I see the temptation. Wow, that was brutal, Vern. Also, uh, invasion of privacy much? I felt like a whole episode. I think it was just the first half. <laughs> it was packed. Alright, what kind of food does this guy want? We can get a spell for it. Make no no promises. I don't know, some some of these immigration officers be doing too much. It's not that serious, bro. Recently I got the the airport interrogation room, and it was not fun. It's like I get it, but, but also I don't get it. And please relax. This is great. That's great. Let's also put a timer on this. Why? I guess Fern doesn't have a whole lot of social experience. Her social experience being mostly limited to free rent, the the epitome of social grace and warmth and conversationalism. Alright, what grimoire is gonna solve this international war? <laughs> this conflict. Notice that Eisner took the smaller portion. I'm a big boy. <laughs> I eat my ice cream with a big boy spoon. Well, sort of. I'm learning remotely. That's what Fern said. We're not jealous of Fern's attention, are we? But that would be beneath Fern. What we know of her so far. Wow, I wouldn't go that far so fast. I don't think anyone in this party is normal. Yeah. They need to team up to fight the real enemy of the show. Fern's time management. Yeah. Two kids get into trouble. Yeah, coming from her, I think that was a compliment, somehow. He's pointing at his face <laughs> just to drive the point home. Look at this scoundrel face. I hate when people do that. That's, that's, what is his name? What is his name? Einer Eisen. He's so tiny. Wow, this is How do you, I mean, realistically, how do you top that? Kudaranakte I feel like there's a very sweet reunion coming between them two. Or a very sad lack of reunion between these two. That's what I'm saying. It's one of those beautiful things when both people love each other and are worried they're not doing enough for the other. Oh yes, this is exactly my Korean immigration experience. <laughs> Just kidding. Nah, bro, I'm trying to get books. I'm trying to get books and sweets. I think at a parade? Everyone clapped at the end. But, like, it's real. 
あ、始めからフリーレイン様の名前を出してもらえますか。いつも無駄だと思っていたんだよ。They Right. Although I really like the early episodes of just Fern and Freerun, I like having Stark in the party. I like how they're setting up his, his character and his relationship with Aizen as a fractal of the larger whole of, you know, legacy, living up to legacy, honoring the past, discovering who you are now in, in comparison to what you were, realizing a little bit too late the things that you were missing in really critical moments, but hoping or striving that you can make it whole, make it right again, or fi at least find some closure on it. The dragon thing was packed with significance for me. People often use metaphorically the idea of fighting a dragon when talking about the sort of like self-challenge, understanding the gap between what you are and what you perceive yourself to be and how that plays a, a large role in your own concept of self and confidence, satisfaction with one's life. There's a parallel to the other show I'm watching, Hunter, Hunter x Hunter, with Kalua, who doesn't know if he could act, right? But we all sort of know the potential's there, and it'll just come down to how prepared he is. And, you know, both Kalua in that show and Stark in this show have channeled that frustration into a pinpoint that ends up being a positive force for them, where they do the work they need to do to be as prepared as they possibly can be and give themselves the best chance of success that they could possibly have. And so you get the sense that all it's going to take is just time. And there are elements that you can control, like a lot of life is circumstantial, when will these moments arise? How much time do you have until the critical moment? How many critical moments do you get? But you focus on the things that are most actionable, which is who you are, what you're doing, how you're preparing, what you're becoming, how you spend your time. And then you round that off with like just overall faith in yourself and not resorting to categorical black and white ruminations about how you're not capable of something. I can't do something. I was born to not be able to do this. I have a curse, et cetera, et cetera. All these useless concepts that can just be completely discarded. And then you have the beautiful thing of like Aisa not being perfect, being threatened by <laughs> the kid's greatness to the point where it's sort of to anger. There's so much to work with there. I think their relationship, even though they're not even together anymore, they're not sharing a screen, is something that can be really magical.